Talking jazz really is the words of jazz musicians. And uh, for me to be uh, able to present this in a literary form is really is a great pleasure. One of the things that I really loved about talking to these musicians was it was an informal situation, but we always knew that we were doing it for history. It was never just thrown away. I know everybody who uh, sat on the other side of the microphone from me was very serious, but at the same time, it felt like this feels tonight, people having coffee, people talking. And under the right circumstances, I think that's the best way to get people to, uh, to really come forth. The song is called uh, Now is the Time. The interesting thing about this song is it's a thrown away blues that uh, Charlie Parker wrote. And uh, not long after he wrote it, uh, somebody uh, wrote a song called The Hucklebuck and made millions and millions of dollars. The Hucklebuck is simply Charlie Parker's song Now is the Time, stolen. Traditionally, it's been said, jazz is people's music. And uh, I think it's appropriate to, to start talking about Charlie Parker, because more than any one individual, I think he represents not only the flowering of the music and uh, the height, both intellectually and artistically, of what the music became, but he was very much a, a, a man of the people. Let me read from an interview. <laughs> with a man named Frank Morgan. Uh, here's a, the introduction, actually. Alto saxophonist Frank Morgan still answers his telephone, Bebop lives. It would be equally appropriate to celebrate the fact that Frank Morgan lives, because his life story is a classic encapsulation of the Bebop movement, with all the humanity and tragedy that that music has to offer. Frank became addicted to heroin by age 17 because he thought this would please his friend and hero, Charlie Parker. In his own words, I tried to be a better junkie than Charlie Parker was. His musical style was rising fast in the mid-50s when drug-related offenses caused him to spend the first of what was ultimately to become over 25 years in prison. From the opening notes of the following conversation, it was clear that like Frank Morgan's ballads, this came straight from the heart. Frank, it's really a pleasure to see you looking so well. Well, it's my pleasure. You know, this is a realization of another dream for me because during the years I spent in prison, I used to listen to your radio program all the time, and so it was a dream of mine to be free and to meet you, and now here we are. Okay, let's go back to the beginning of the story. Does the story begin when you were seven years old? Yes, around seven, I went to Detroit from Milwaukee, Wisconsin, where I was living, to spend an Easter vacation with my mother and father. My father was Stanley Morgan, a guitarist, and my mother, Geraldine, was on the road with my father. He was working in Detroit at the time, and he took me to a theater that had stage shows, the Paradise Theater and Jay McShann's band was featured that week. And like out of a dream, when Charlie Parker stood up and played his alto solo, I later found out it was the song Hootie Blues. I heard my voice, and a new life began. So at the age seven, you ceased being your father's man and became your own man by way of Charlie Parker. Yes, like I say, I heard my voice. To make it a little more clear, I heard the voice that I would like to be, and I'm still pursuing that, you know? I mean, I take this seriously, no matter how frightening it gets, and it does get frightening. It's very frightening for a 54-year-old person to deal with success when you've never dealt with anything but failure before. I worked hard at failure. I mean, I worked hard at it. I gave it my best. So I'm trying to learn how to give success my best now. It's not easy. It's frightening. Do you feel that in some ways you got the chance on behalf of a lot of guys who didn't survive? Sure, I have a tremendous responsibility, tremendous responsibility, and I love it, you know. I'm trying to be up to the task. That's why I got to practice hard. It makes you feel lucky you stuck to your guns, huh, Frank? Yeah, bebop lives. Let me tell you a little story about this next person I'm going to quote and read from. His name is John Hendricks. He's a fantastic jazz singer. He uh, is a brilliant lyricist. I mean, brilliant, beyond... Uh, I think uh, the distance between him and the next best jazz lyricist uh, can be measured in miles, not feet or yards or inches. Um, 
I first met John in the mid-70s. Uh, I produced a record for him. Actually, it was kind of funny. He had gotten a record deal with a company called Arista Records, run by a man named Clive Davis. Uh, Clive liked to f uh, fancy himself as a friend of the artist, you know, so he befriended John and gave him a recording budget and actually gave John some of the money. So John spent the money, you know. I mean, he, was, he had his priorities. And then he was going to make this record, and there wasn't any money to make the record, so that's when they called me in, because I was kind of the the budget producer, you know. And I came in, and I was such a tremendous fan of John's, you know. I was going to do anything to get this record made. Um, and it was wonderful getting to spend time with him. He told me a lot of stories about how one actually writes song lyrics uh, to jazz solos. And it was instructive and wonderful. Uh, one day I was in the uh, studio with John. We were waiting for the rest of the band to show up. And uh, we were playing whatever stuff together. And he said to me, do you know this song, Old Folks? I said, no, I don't think so. He said, oh, it's a great song. Let me show it to you. And he told me some chords, and he sang, and told me some more chords and sang. And he really sang his heart out. You know, he, he right there gave me the instruction that you only can do music one way, and that's all the way. And I think that's true about jazz musicians. When they pick up their horn, they mean it. There's no honor almost on. It's on or off. So he really performed this song, Old Folks, and I'm kind of following him on the piano. When it was over, the recording engineer came out of the control room and said, hey, by the way, guys, I recorded that. Do you want to hear it? So they played it back to us, and John said, that's the best I ever sang that song. That's going on the record. I said, wait a minute, John. I was playing piano. We couldn't take my piano away, and I was making some mistakes because I didn't know the song. He said, no, that's it. That's on the record. I'm sorry. I never sang it that good, and that's it. <laughs> I said, well, you can't, we can't really do that, you know? I mean, I'm, now I'm thinking, right? He turned to me, he said, very patiently, he said, Ben, don't you understand? He said, the mistakes, sometimes that's the only part that's jazz. The last interview I want to uh, read for you is an excerpt from the interview I did with Miles Davis. Um, it was done in January uh, 1986. Um, I'll just read you a little bit of what the introduction from the book says. The following interview was held on a warm January afternoon on the terrace at Miles Davis's beach house in Malibu, California. I had gone to the house with Miles' record producer at the time, who had told me that Miles' reputation for being a difficult man to talk to was not necessarily true. From the moment Miles opened the large wooden front door to his house and invited us inside, it was obvious that this was the case. In fact, when we were introduced, Miles inexplicably gave me a big hug. Throughout the interview, which took place during the afternoon and continued well into the evening, Miles was gracious, humorous, extremely generous with his time. The interview began with us sitting across from each other at a table with a bowl of potato chips in between. Miles had a sketch pad in his lap, and as we were talking, he was drawing. I can still hear the sound of the water and then miles, you know. Yeah, my father taught me and my brother. Actually, I showed my brother how to sketch. My brother can see anything and draw it right off, you know, but he doesn't have any imagination like I have. So imagination is, imagination is everything. It's everything. My impression is that your drawings are related to your playing in some ways, the gestures. What it is is balance. If you make a drawing on a page, you have to balance it, you know. And that's the way everything is. Art, music, composition, solos, clothes, you know, when you dress up. Balance. Yeah, a little over here, a little over there, a little over here. <laughs> I first noticed your sketches on the cover of one of your record albums a few years ago. Is drawing something you've always done and has always been part of the, your artistic process, or did you become interested in it later in life? Yeah, you know, I stopped for a while. I really started to sketch again after I married Cicely, because she takes so long. You know how actresses are. They take so long to get ready, you know? Rather than scream at her, I just started sketching. 
Miles, how come nobody else can get your sound? It's a simple thing, a gesture, but it's very difficult. I have my own sound because when I was like this, my trumpet instructor, I loved the way he sounded. He was black and he used to play with Andy Kirk and the low register like Harold Baker. You know, I just leaned toward that cornet sound, you know? But it's just a sound. It's popular, you know? Like years ago, composers. The reason you read about Beethoven was because he was the one they could understand. The other ones, you know, they couldn't understand. They didn't get mentioned. So my tone just must be easy for people to hear, you know? Like Louis Armstrong. But you see your sound, it's like, it's like your sweat, you know? It's your sound. Lester Young had his sound, Coleman Hawkins, Clifford Brown, Fats, you know, there's no more sound today. During those days when you didn't have anybody to copy, guys got their own sound. But now that you have so many records and cassettes, it's not about sound, you know what I mean? That's the reason they can put the sound in a keyboard, like a sampling keyboard. But it's the white sound in the keyboard. It's the white trumpet player sound in the keyboard. You mean you can't put the black sound in the digital sampling keyboard? Nobody can do it yet. Well, that's an interesting point. Before there was such a wide recording distribution, people were forced to develop their own sounds, forced to play with it. They didn't have anything to listen to, you know, but you would watch guys play an instrument, and you would like the attitude, the concept, the way it looks, the way they hold it, the way they dress. But nowadays, I saw maybe three trumpet players in Lionel Hampton's band, they were white, right? And they all sounded alike. Winton, he don't have a distinctive sound, but Freddie Hubbard has. Woody Shaw is creative. He's like Dizzy. They might do anything. I mean, you can still get a good solo out of Dizzy. Ah, uh, he really turned my brain. And Charlie Parker, you know those guys, they did a number on my head as far as me learning. How did they do it? They just opened me up. You mean just watching them? See what they were thinking, it put a stamp on what I was thinking, that it was okay to think like I was thinking. I got one more question for you, Miles. The song Nardis. How'd you happen to write it and name it Nardis? I can't remember. I think I wrote it, maybe it has something to do with nuclear power. I wrote it for Cannonball Adderley, I think. I just like the name. What does it mean? I don't know, Miles, but it's my last name backwards. No kidding. I didn't know that. It's a nice name, man. Mm -hmm.